Good Sabbath everyone. Good to be here with you and with those that are online listening again. We continue this week in our series on the commandments of Christ. Now for those of you who may be new listening in to this series, it's based on Jesus' command in John 14, 15, where he said that if we love him, we would keep his commandments. The idea is not that the keeping of his commandments somehow earns our salvation, but rather is our way of showing our love to him for our salvation and his ongoing love and provision for us. Now with that in mind, let's turn to our passage in Matthew 18. Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 10 and going through verse 14. Matthew 18, 10 through 14. Now a portion of today's message is an adaptation of a message by Pastor Dean Schreiber. Okay, folks, if you've been part of the previous sermons on chapter 18, you will remember that uh, Jesus has been using children as an example of what our mindset should be in relating to his kingdom and to those who are in their infancy and walking with God. In Matthew 18, verses 2 through 4, Jesus tells his disciples that in order to even enter the kingdom, one must become humble like a little child. Entering the kingdom requires us to become totally dependent upon Christ alone. Then in verses 5 through 9, Jesus goes on to warn us that we must never cause other believers, especially young or weak believers, to stumble into sin. And I think it is the weak believer that Jesus especially has in mind when he continues in verses 10 through 14 that we're going to cover today. Here Jesus says, See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. Now before diving into the text, I would like to ask you a few questions. You ever find yourself asking God to give you patience with those believers who just grate on your nerves? Do you ever wish that Some Christians would just grow up in the Lord. Do you find yourself wondering if some of them will ever get off the sidelines and into the trenches with the rest of us? Do you get frustrated and wish they would quit watching and start participating in God's work? Or how about those who seem to have been truly saved at one time but now backslidden and or are living in open sin and you wonder if God ever was truly in their life? Surely I'm not the only one who's ever had those thoughts running through my mind, right? Well, Jesus speaks to these very folks and to us here in the passage today. He says, See that you do not despise one of these little ones. Don't despise the weak in faith. If you want it in modern language, don't despise the weak in faith. The word despise means to lose esteem for, or to think little of, or nothing of. Lose esteem for, think little or nothing of. Well, let's start today by being honest. Sometimes we disappoint each other as believers. Sometimes we sin against each other. Sometimes we irritate each other. And let each other down. And along with those things comes a temptation. It's the temptation to close our hearts to one another. It's the temptation to complain about each other and to criticize one another. It's the temptation to write each other off as worthless. If we yield to those temptations, Jesus says we sin. We sin. 
We sin because as believers we have no right. No right to cut them loose or to cause them to stumble. We have no right to reject people that God accepts. We have no right to hate people God loves. Now I know I'm talking about church people. There's no way that uh, having the love of Christ in their heart and everything that they ever have those kind of thoughts, much less act them out, right? Well, good. Then maybe this doesn't apply to anybody listening or here today. Let's move on. Jesus says we are to always remember that regardless of their progress or lack thereof in service to God, regardless of their production or lack thereof of fruit, they have the same standing before God that we do. I know that's hard to wrap our mind around. Because of God's grace, all the Father sees is the blood of Christ. And newsflash, it not only covers a multitude of their sins, but of ours too. We are in no position to think less of those believers around us because the same grace that works in us is working in them as well. Jesus says here, we are not to despise them because of what we perceive to be less than what we think they ought to be in Christ. No, when we stop caring about other believers, especially weak, stumbling believers, we stop caring about people who are the apple of God's eye. Take a second and look around at the people sitting around next to you this morning. Look directly at the person sitting right next to you. Do you know how much that person matters to God? If that person is a believer, Jesus says, be careful you don't look down on them. Jesus says, be careful you don't look down on them because every believer in this room is literally an object of angelic concern. Let's look again at Matthew 18.10. Jesus says, See that you do not look down on one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. Now whether Jesus is referring to individual garden angels or the ministry of angelic hosts in general, one thing is clear. The angels themselves take an interest in our lives. They care for us. They're concerned for us. And even as they dwell in the presence of Almighty God, they express their displeasure whenever the least of God's children are rejected, abused, or seduced into sin. Every believer is the object of angelic concern. Jesus goes on to say, When you despise or think less of, and as a result, treat differently your brother or sister in Christ, not only are you getting an angel's attention, you're getting noticed by God and not in a good way. Jesus goes on in this passage to say, What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, Will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than the ninety-nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. Now in this parable, God reveals the depth of his love for every believer. Listen, folks. God loves those fickle, wandering sheep every bit as much as he loves those faithful, stable sheep who never seem to stray. Sometimes we forget that. In our sin, 
we tend to condemn the weak believer. We forget that they get the same grace that we do. We forget that Jesus died on the cross for them as much as us. Even as a pastor, there are times when I stand back and look at the repetitiveness of someone's backsliding into sin, the unwillfulness to stand up and be counted for him, and my impulse is to want to shake my head in frustration and walk away. Not because I don't realize my own failures, but because I simply struggle to understand the depth of God's love, mercy, and grace. So I ask you, when will we learn? When will we learn that God is not like that? That is one way we are different from God, when God sees the weak believer, he doesn't shake his head in disgust. What does he say here that he does? He goes after them. God goes after the divorcee. God goes after the porn addict. He goes after that woman, that man who's fallen into sexual sin. God goes after the thief. God goes after the proud. God goes after the temperamental. You see, he goes after those sheep who are foolish and immature, those little ones in Christ. And if you'll stop and think about it, you'll know it's true. You'll know it's true because I bet you've experienced it. I bet there's been at least one time in your life when the Savior had to come after you and call you out of the sin that you were in. Church, God knows every one of the sheep in his flock. He knows where each of us is. And he knows when the least of us strays from the fold. Jesus says here that the Father loves each of us deeply and individually. God sees you and knows you as an individual. That's why... John 10.3 says he calls his own sheep by name. Now in Psalm 139, King David was overwhelmed with this truth when he wrote, O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. And I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Do we get it? Do you get it, folks? God knows us inside out. You're not forgotten today. You've not been left alone. Neither has your wayward brother or sister in the Lord. This is why God says don't despise them. Don't think less of them. Show them the same love that God shows you. Folks, God knows us inside out. And regardless how you may feel, you are not forgotten today. You have not been left alone. Neither has your wayward brother or sister in the Lord. God knows you intimately. In Christ, God is intimately involved in your and in their life. Both you and they are his child. And I can promise you that he hasn't lost you or them in the crowd of people on this earth. 
The second truth Jesus teaches us about the Father's love flows naturally out of the first. If God knows each of us individually, he also pursues each of us individually when we stray. Jesus says, what do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine and go to look for the one that wandered off? This is not so hard to understand. Know this. If you belong to Jesus Christ, and you find yourself tangled up in sin or self-centeredness, God is coming after you. You have wandered from the fold. And if he doesn't come after you, if he doesn't discipline you and rob you of the peace that passes understanding, that's a pretty good sign that maybe you really haven't committed your life to Christ. But wait, it gets even better than that. In verse 13, Jesus continues to paint the picture of a shepherd by saying, And if he finds it, the lost sheep, I tell you the truth, he is happier about that one sheep than the ninety-nine that did not wander off. You see, the whole point of this parable for you and me is this. We are called to care for each other in exactly the same way God the Father cares for us. We must never lead another believer into sin. We must never look down on a weaker Christian. We must never hold them in contempt. We must never write them off as hopeless. I cannot be a faithful pastor, and you cannot be a faithful believer, if we're not willing to love each other and receive each other in spite of our weaknesses. Now that doesn't leave us without a responsibility to try to hold one another accountable and help one another grow in our walk with God. And we'll cover that next week. But the point I want you to carry away is that we need to look at everyone else who calls on the name of Christ through the Father's eyes. We need to adopt His heart and instead of despising them, run after them with a heart of love and concern that wants to help them bear them up and encourage them in their walk with God and help them grow in their faith. This is our call, to not despise those who are weak in the faith, but to be there for them. I leave you with an admonishment from the Apostle Paul with regard to our view and treatment of others in Christ. You're welcome to turn there, Philippians 2, 3-13. Philippians 2, 3-13. Paul says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but instead in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not account his equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but instead emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient even to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to will.
and to work for his good pleasure. Amen.